Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, friends of Conversion. I'm so proud that so many of you are still here. I mean, the sun is shining. There's beer. There's a beach. So that makes me really proud. Thank you very much. I have a bad news at the beginning. You know, Pip and I, we were talking about my topic. That was uh, like one year ago. <laughs> And uh, two days ago, I found out that he has chosen this topic, but I don't have slides for that topic. <coughs> I'm sorry. So, who, who wants to hear the five neuromarketing hacks? Please raise your hand. Oh, damn it. <sighs> but I have cool effects. Look at that. Uh, I, really, I really like that. You know, it. <sighs> city is burning. <sighs> you know what? Tomorrow, Prit. He will talk a lot about cognitive biases and your marketing stuff. So to be honest, I don't want to take this thing from his speech. It, it will be double. So it does not make any sense. So I thought maybe it's better. So bad news for all of you who wanted to hear this. You will hear it tomorrow from Preet. I thought it might be good after such a day with all that information to like sum up, wrap up everything we've learned today from all these great speakers. So that's kind of my talk now. Uh, so you will see, I will refer to all the speeches that you saw now already. And bonus for all of you who raised the hat, I've integrated the five neuro hacks, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so this is me, um, not John on the left there. Uh, today in the morning we made an A-B test. Who has the dumbest face? on a photograph. So KPI was look dumb. Uh, what do you think, who won? Uh, John? Thank you. Thank you, that's so nice from you. I appreciate that. So um, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I'm um, Andre, I've, I've, I've written a book about conversion optimization. In Germany we say conversion optimierung. Okay, who speaks German? Wow, I can do that in German. No, I'm just kidding. I know all the rest of you. So I, I also do a conference about conversion optimization. It's called Conversion Summit. That's not German. And I have a blog called Konversionskraft, which actually is a very German word. You know, like, you, you know the German word for butterfly? So in, in English, it's butterfly, how beautiful. Or papillon in French, yeah? And in German, it's Schmetterling. Okay? <laughs> so, Konversionskraft. Okay, so, ah, uh, marketing, blah, 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 skip that. I thought, what could you fancy in the evening when your brain nearly explodes? And I thought about pictures of elderly, naked women. <laughs> yeah, because it's exercise time. So, no, you don't have to dance, I promise you. You don't have to dance. Um, but you have to stand up, please. I'm sorry, I know you hate that. So. And I promise, you don't have to talk to your neighbors <laughs> or touch them or things like that. <laughs> Nothing like that. Nobody wants to touch other ones. No. So, <laughs> I want to prove how good you paid attention to the talks today, okay? This is a test. And the ones that are right in this test, in this exam, they are like conversion heroes, okay? So let's see if you really um, paid attention. So I will show you some A-B tests like this. They're generating leads and they tested value propositions against authority effect here. So now you have to make a chain, choice. What do you think? <laughs> you know the solution, Pip, right? <laughs> what do you think? think what variation got them 22% more leads. Decide, I give you the solution now. So everybody else, sit down. I'm sorry, you're out of the game. The ones who picked this one, you now can sit down. Come on, be honest to yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Second one. Did you pay attention? John was talking about carousels that he tested. 
paid attention. This is a test. Carousel with a lot of elements against the plain version without elements. They've got them 75% more revenue. What do you think? Which variation was the right one? Left or right? Make a decision. Of course, right one, not the carousel. So again, please sit down. Oh, you paid good attention. A good crowd. Damn it, I only have one more. <laughs> but this will now separate the heroes from the losers. So this is an add to cart section. And you see, I'm sorry, it's in German, so you have to believe me. They said, uh, which one is better? This has like a wish list, so you don't have to put things in the cart if you don't like them to buy. And this says you don't, like, you don't need the wish, wish list. You can, you can change the things in your cart at any time. So what do you think works better, left or right? Make a decision. Left. So everybody, please sit down. So please, a warm hand for everybody who was right. To be honest, you all were wrong. Why? Do you believe that shit? <laughs> Honestly? These are A, B case studies from hell. You should never believe them. You should never play the witch test one game because Look at that, 159% uplift, really, in an e-commerce store by just changing the buttons? Is that what we do each day? I mean, that's maybe what we dream at night, what we do. <laughs> okay, but actually we do like 1.59% uplift. So, first problem with this test. Why exactly did it work? They changed so many things. Why? Because of the bigger button, or the wish list, or this additional text, or you know that thing when you mix up several changes in one variation, because of course it's expensive to isolate everything. So I'm sure a lot of people did this mistake. So you have a winner, and you ask yourself why. So, so confess, yeah? Eh. Confess. Never do that, because at the end, you don't learn anything. You maybe have a winner, but you completely destroyed your option to learn something. And that's the biggest loss you can have, okay? So, second problem, if there is a case study, always, always, also for speakers that are here, please dare to ask, what's the information about test duration and sample size? As Craig said already, you should test in different cycles. I will talk about this later. Otherwise, this is bullshit. Remember this number, 159% more revenue. This is a 30 million euro e-commerce shop. Not possible. So I would call this bullshit. So, um, And because I like this effect, I did it again. There. <laughs> so. Never believe A-B test case studies. It's like the advertisement of McDonald's, you know? Um, <laughs> why? Because an A-B test is always something you did under certain conditions, okay? It's not the reality. It's a small part of the reality. And you have to be aware about this. i show you what happens. This is a test of a big German insurance, direct insurance company. They asked us to change something on the website. It was just a small change. And it was their idea. So, of course, we developed that test. We set it up, and after one hour, they called us. <laughs> Guess what they said? <laughs> stop the test. Please stop the test. <laughs> Why? <laughs> we have to report good numbers. OK, but let's see if the test is still as good after one day, OK? So, what happens just after several hours more, you see? I mean, they're making a 360 million euros new business each year. So imagine this is true. I mean, can you imagine going to your boss saying, yo, I, I doubled new business. It's now 720 million. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> no, of course not. So uh, after one day, it, it was still like 34 million euros. 
that's still damn good. So they really pushed us to stop that test. But we did not. We said, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. That, that's not true. It's just one day. You know, people behave differently on uh, weekdays or weekends if the sun is shining. And, and look at that uh, sample size, you know, 113 versus 121. So uh, Visual Website Optimizer says it's a 75% chance to be the original. So still not enough data. So we have to keep it longer. After two days, 10%. So as a good optimizer, you think, yeah, we did it. I mean, it's still at 10%. So it's, it's grooving in, yeah? We will keep that number. But then we had a bad day. Look at that. Only 3%. That's only like... 10 million euros. <laughs> Only 20 Ferrari La Enzo or whatever. <laughs> Compared with 700 million, but, oh, that's pure. So the good thing, test recovered. After seven days, it's 8%. Tool says high chance to be the original. So statistically, it's good now. So we could stop it, right? No, no, no. <laughs> I have to work on the, on the drama of my presentation, I think. <laughs> yeah, of course not. After two weeks, it's that. After four weeks, it's crap. So you see, this was crap from the beginning, to be honest. It could not work. When you see the variations, you would have to uh, say that, of course, it can't work because you don't see the change. And how can something that you can't see affect the behavior of people? It can't. So. The 0% is truth, and I would say this is, a, this is a basic problem of conversion optimization. We all like underpant gnomes, okay? You, you know the underpant gnomes? Who knows it? That's good, good number, underpant gnome. For all the others, underpant gnomes, they, they have a, an evil plan. You know, it's collecting underpants. They're stealing them in the night. Nobody sees them. That's phase one. Phase two, oh. Uh, and phase three is make profit out of it. So A-B testing is something similar. It's let's do A-B tests, 26% uplift, this must be a profit. <laughs> it's not true. There is something in between test results and having the money at your bank account. There's something in between. And my, this is just my guess. This is not a survey. My guess is that 70% of optimizers don't know that there is something in between. 20% have no answer, and maybe 10% of all of you know that there's something in between and know the solution. So I want to talk about this. And remember this. This is how your testing tool reports your data. It says the amount of conversions, chance to be the original, uplift. And first thing you see, these are really small numbers. Tool already says it's significant. But look at this. This is a statistical calculation we made in Excel. It's based on a 95% confidence level. How much conversions per variation do you need to prove a certain uplift? So depending on a high contrast or a low contrast, you need more or less conversions. So if you want to prove um, like a 20% uplift, I'm sorry, I can't read it really well, it's like here, uh, maybe 400 or 500 conversions per variation are okay. And that will work in lead um, or email opt-in conversion goals, lead generation or email opt-in. You get numbers like this. But in e-commerce, who's in e-commerce? Who sells stuff? Premium KPI is sales, order. It's much harder because if people really have to buy something, they come and go and decide, and people are complicated, nasty customers. Uh, you will have uplifts maybe between three, four, five, six percent. So you're here, like with, with 16, 17,000 conversions per variation to prove that the two point something percent uplift is right. I know this is a lot of numbers, and the, it's even worse because. If you apply this to segments, I know you can segment you to death until you find an uplift. Look at the segments until you find an uplift. But you have the same problem. You have the same problem. And this phenomenon also applies to your segments. The only problem is that there's maybe no testing tool that calculates your CTBO or your significance. 
and then you are fucked, honestly, because you report something that's not true. So, I feel the energy. <laughs> yeah, this is the sad part of the story. It's, but it's a mathematical law, and you can't work against these laws. You just cannot do it. I cannot tell people with few conversions that they can do the same amount of A-B tests as a big retailer with 100,000 conversions a month. It's just not possible. It's like you want to build a plane and you ignore gra gravity, okay? It won't work. So I think it's better to tell you there are options. I developed this model. It says you have a choice what amount of validity you want to have. You can go for just 80% instead of 95% confidence. Or you can choose to use other numbers. Or you can stop trying to prove that an uplift is right. You can just say the variation is better. I don't know how much, but it's better. Problem is, testing tools always report the average uplift. So that, that's the problematic thing. You have a choice, and you have to realize you have a cost of decision. So if you want to prove that something has exactly 26.23% uplift, you need a much bigger sample size than, with in, than compared to the situation where you say it's just OK to prove that variation B is better. I don't care how much. It's just plain better. That's maybe here, very low cost. But then stop telling everybody what the uplift was. Because it's wrong. It's a lie. Stop it. Or what mostly happens, <laughs> you interpret, interpret wrong data, and you think you have an uplift, but you haven't, and you tell the wrong numbers, then you also have a high cost of too few uh, validity, because you're making the wrong decisions. So, most people think they're here. They just see the numbers in the testing tool, 26 percent, and they're happy. They think they are here, but eh, they're not here. Honestly, you're there. And why do we want to think that? And that's my first neuro hack. <laughs> it's called confirmation bias. Of course, we worked for weeks on that concept. We wanted to prove that it's right. We believe so hard that our optimization is a real optimization that we just wait for a tool to prove it. So confirmation bias means we select our information and data according to our opinion. Of course it is our opinion that our variation is better. One of the biggest mistakes of every optimizer. So, believe it or not, but significance is not validity. This is really important to know. Significance just means, from a statistical point of view, two samples compared. Is it a random effect? Is it an artifact? Or is there a real difference? So what are the options? Maybe you don't have 17,000 conversions. Anybody here who has like 10 or 20,000 conversions each month as a primary goal? That's good. Cool. You're out of that. <laughs> But for everybody else, what are your options? When you see that diagram, you know it. Change the business, go for lead generation, <laughs> then you're here. Uh, lower, your, uh, your, lower your regulations, like what amount of validity do I really want? So have a lower amount. Or have more contrast. Don't go for three or four percent. Make optimizations that get you in this area. Because things that are here, you won't be able to, to say if it's right or wrong. So my idea, if you want high contrast, what is an uplift? What is an uplift, to be honest? It's a number. But what is cause and what is effect? I showed this last year. Who was here last year, saw my presentation? Cool. So this is like part two of my presentation. For all the others that were not here, these are three slides of last year. Because I think that's also a big problem. We, we think this is our reality, OK? Happy customers, credit card ready, they're all buying, yeah. 
<laughs> we send traffic to a website and we measure what happens in analytics. We change website, we measure the change. No. Truth is that people perceive a website, think, should I move my hand, should I click, and the click we measure. So if we run an A-B test, what do we measure? The conversion rate? No. The uplift is the amount of behavior change that we've made because we changed the website. Different website, people start to think differently, people start to behave differently, and that is what we can measure. So, if we want a high uplift, we have to realize that we have to change people's decision. And the second slide from last year that I want to, to show is this Facebook test. You remember it, the other guys? There you can see the difference between template optimization. Most optimizers optimize templates. You know, what, what could I to do on this template to improve the website? I could, I could move the button here, hide the button, blah, maybe dynamically. So if you go on the left, it switches to the right, or whatever. <laughs> of course, you could do that. You could change the template. But it won't have an effect. And what Facebook did is they worked on the motivation of people. They said, if you quit Facebook, your friends will no longer be able to follow you. That. Tim will miss you. <gasps> And your 297 friends also. David will miss you. Julia, <gasps> not Julia, no. So, this changes behavior, okay? This changes the motivation of people. So, this is powerful. And to recap that, in how many presentations did you see the BJ Fogg behavioral model? Two, two. And it's good, the model is right, but it's academic. It, how can you use the BJ Fogg model? What, what do you do with it? Calculating B equals mat? What is mm, mat, at? Don't know. Other way around. I call it the ROI pyramid. Ability means in a real store, I am able to open the door and enter the store. Does not equal I like to buy. So this is the next level. I want to buy something. And there's even a third level that BJ, is that his first name? Hello, BJ. Maybe. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Is it a first name? People don't, don't name BJ. <laughs> Benjamin, J whatever. So he forgot this level <laughs> in, in his model. And it says, I have to buy. You know, you know when people have to buy something? Drugs. I need a cigarette, <sighs> beer. Who needs a beer? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> it's that level. Or Apple products, you know? Drug dealers, Apple products, it's the same. <laughs> New iPhone 6, I have to buy it. So there is a secret force called brand that pushes me. <laughs> so Apple does not have to work on the usability. They could hide the button. People would start searching for it, okay? <laughs> So this is the difference of the several levels that BJ Fogg has in his formula. So a potential for optimization, 90% is here, only 10% is there. So if you want to go for big uplifts, don't tweak templates. Don't think you have a problem with ability. You have a problem with motivation. So you have to ask yourself, how can I motivate my people? What people do I have on my website? How can I motivate them? This is the practical version of that. How can I motivate people that are on this shop? And by the way, what's this shop about? For what kind of people is that shop? People with beards, long hair, and wearing strange hats. How is it called? A hat? A hat? Cap. A cap. What kind of, it's about fashion, okay, you agree? So what kind of fashion do they sell? You know it? Casual, yeah. And is it low quality, high quality? Low quality? So average, yeah, it's, it's streetwear fashion. That's why they have beards. I mean, he has a beard, she doesn't have, 
um, anyway. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but look how they look. That's an implicit code. It's an implicit code for fashion. Like you try to look like this in the next business meeting. It means you're good at fashion, right? <laughs> High fashion. Like. So <laughs> why should you buy there? Any idea? Because they look so nice? Here's the answer. Look at that. I'm sorry, I, I can't read it. I have to step up. It says, for, I, I have to translate it. It says, welcome to Frontline Shop, a selection of style. Anybody has the feeling that he needs to buy there now? No? <laughs> it says, authenticity, quality, uniqueness, and innovations are values that we at Frontline Shop value a lot. That's why we invest in our uh, long-lasting experience as a street fashion online. Did I raise your motivation? Come on. <laughs> of course not, because it's a bullshit blah, blah, blah marketing text. What's our value proposition? Let's write a grayish thing that nobody can read because we are embarrassed by ourselves. So when I think about changing motivation, it's one easy question that you have to answer. Why should I buy here? Give me a reason. Why should I buy here? So if you develop hypotheses based on that question, then you have to rate them. You have to prioritize them. How can I get a good uplift? First, I have to ask myself, if I change anything, will it be perceived by the people? If it's not perceived, they won't change their behavior. It's not in the brain, doesn't work. Second step, if I change this website, I have to ask myself, is it relevant for the people? The gray text there, is it relevant? No, it's blah, blah, blah. It doesn't have any value. So if I change the website, I have to be aware that this is an important question. So I think it's good to rate hypotheses from one to five stars, but you can improve it by giving away these stars by answering these questions. Or third question, that's good if it differentiates yourself from your competitors. Give bonus points for differentiation. And you can also give bonus points if you use some psychological principles. Why? Because psychologists already worked on these principles. They have already proven that these principles are right. You don't have to reinvent the game. So what we did was a hard struggle because testing on the Website is CI, don't change it, na 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 na, things like that, discussions with the client. What we made is we tried to put the, the content from this banner inside a more visual element. So we have a little more attention span for people to perceive it. And we need a little more place. So two principles first, more space, second, visually, and a little bit user experience, joy of use. So it's fun to use that thing. And third thing, we repeated it. It's not just on the home page. It's everywhere. And that's also a, a psychological effect, a hack that you can use. It's called the mere exposure effect. Important things, you should repeat them. So if you test something on a landing, landing page, that's good. but it will maybe lose 80% or 90% of its power if you're not continuing with this thing on the whole user journey. For things like sale, imagine you have a homepage saying, big sale, where is the sale at the end of the customer journey? Where is it in the cart, on the product page? It's gone. That's stupid. So maintain the scent, uh, repeat elements. We repeated it even on this product page. And now I know I told you don't believe A-B test case studies. Shit, why did I say that? <laughs> so look at the numbers. Um, always ask for these numbers. Test duration, how long did it work? And look at, the, look at the lines. It's important that you see that the test result is not an accident, right? So uh, this is 14 days. At the beginning, you see the noise. This is not significant. But then we have like 2,800 variations, uh, conversions per variation. So this is enough to prove a 7.4% uplift is really valid. 
is not just a random effect, this is a valid effect. Another case, this is lead gen, so you have higher uplifts. Any idea what's it about? You get this cheap, but only for two days. So we made two variations. One focuses on the discount, cheap, and one focuses, this is the, this is the discount variation, and the second is focusing on the only 48 hours. It's focusing on the scarcity. Important effect, you know it already, loss aversion. Once people decided to do something, their whole decision process switches to loss aversion. Remember, if you sit, you want to book a plane, as soon as you know you want to go on that day on to that airport, you change your thinking, oh my god, I hope the flights are not gone. So this is loss aversion. It always works. So if you test it, uh, you get cool results. This is how you can improve uplift by using psychological principles. A lot of more leads. But that's what Paul said. Good point. From this on, we made two or three experiments. We could not get any more uplift. We optimized ourselves to death. So we needed a fresh idea, a new thing. We made this because we interviewed some people. They said, yeah, I don't have the feeling that it's for the Austrian market. This was for Austria. Anybody here for Austria? So <laughs> this was important for these people. It says, thank you, Austria. You made us number one Austrian flag, things like this. That was emotional resonance. That's the, that's the principle we call. This is, this is uh, like fertilizer yeah, for, for all the psychological principles you build on it. Because it's more relevant, I told you. Question number two, is it relevant for me? And you see, this is much more relevant. Bam. This is, again, retest this variation. Not that strong as first time, but again, 110% uplift. And as comparison, this was the old control. So that makes a big difference. When we are testing, we do nothing else than bending our growth curve. Okay? We had a success, so we were bending our growth curve. We just have to repeat that. This is why I said last year, conversion optimization is a stupid name. It sounds like, ah, oh, let's change some buttons. We do growth optimization, okay? We, we do this for fun, of course, but we want cool results. We want to influence something. So look at these two companies. Anybody knows HRS? It's a German company. You can book hotels. Kind of an old company. They exist since more than 40 years, and they've been very successful. They were dominating their market for like 37 years out of their 40 years. And then came this little company called Booking.com. And look what they did. And what's the difference? Ask yourself, as an optimizer, ask yourself, what's the difference between these companies? Both have a couple of hundred thousand hotels, nearly the same price. I can book them in three to five steps online. No different business model. They do online advertising till hell. No difference. Why do they dominate now the market? They overtook HRS internationally three years ago. They overtook it them even in Germany, which is a hard work, this year. Why? They have a team of optimizers. <laughs> they don't. They're testing around a little bit, green button, blue button. <laughs> and they're testing their website to make, them, to make it sell better. They realize the website is a sales person. So they use all these cognitive biases that look, and this knowledge is free. It's completely free. Go to Wikipedia, list of cognitive biases. They're all here. Everything that is inside booking.com is listed here. Last year it was 139. This year is more than 200 principles. This is your job. Just, whoop, just go to one position, by random bandwagon effect. What can we do with the bandwagon effect? Who knows the bandwagon effect? Two, that's cool. Bandwagon effect. It's others say herding, or people change their behavior to what the whole herd is doing. So look at that store. Nobody goes into an empty restaurant, right? Or an empty store. Empty stores, like, ooh, like this. This looks better. 
People like to buy where are a lot of other people. It's a proof that I'm right here. Or even that, look at that. This is perfect because that combines now two principles, herding a lot of people, and look, uh, like four iPads, three iPhone 6, and 200 people. Look at his face. Look at his face. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so that's the principle. And Booking.com knows. They're all talking about Cialdini and scarcity. I can't hear it anymore. I'm so sorry. So but look at this. They understood I can, I can scarce my offer. It does not make any sense if my offer is not attractive. Imagine you're on the street, nobody is there, and you say only five left, but nobody listens. It doesn't work. They only work together. Look how many square pixels Booking.com is using for the bandwagon effect, where they just tell everybody what's going on. It's just pure data that they put inside the website to show people how much is going on here. So. In percent, I would say maybe 15% of the whole screen, just for this effect. And what are they testing? The intensity of the effects, the combination, how strong can I play it when I'm annoying people, what, what's the trade-off zone? So this is what you can do. Go to Wikipedia, look for the biases, look what, what could I do? Could I use it? That's all that Booking.com is doing. That's, that's the main difference. They have like. 200 people that just do this the whole day. And that's the difference between dominating a market and, yeah, dying. This is how e-commerce shops look that don't know anything about the bandwagon effect. Look at that. <laughs> how much is going on there? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> how many people buy there? Nobody. You can feel it. Even if they have 30,000 conversions, nobody's buying there. It looks like, yeah, you can buy something, but you don't have to. OK. So <laughs> no bandwagon effect, no sales. OK, to wrap it up, I'm finished with my slides. You've made it. This is my summary. Everything I was talking about was about the journey that every optimizer does when he's proceeding with his optimization. And you know this curve? What is it? Sorry? Hype cycle. hype cycle. Yes, hype cycle. It's the Gartner hype cycle, which means at the beginning, every th new thing has a hype. And you will come to a stage of disillusionment, where you think, oh, it's not as easy as I thought. But you find some ideas how to make it better. That's an enlightenment. And aha moment where you think, ah, oh, that's how we could do it, and then you get to the last stage. So the examples that I have shown you, the witch test one example, they were 159%. That was here. People who believe stuff like this, they're here. They're still hyped. Oh, I'm, I could test. Oh. They don't know about the problems. Problems are here. The test that I've shown you with the conversion rate that they were shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. This is so demotivating if a test is losing. You know that feeling really bad. So this is when you're here. But maybe it takes a couple of months or years. This is what I wanted to show you with the frontline shop, with the fashion shop. They found out that all their testing did not work. So they n knew that they have to get more contrast. And Booking.com, they're already in this stage. So imagine if you're HRS and they are here. What does it cost HRS to be here instead of here? What does it cost you that you have maybe competitors that are far more on the right side? Imagine that. So what can you do? First thing, I love the effect. And second, realize you're burning money. Everything you do while you're in this stage, forget it. You will realize that you did a lot of tests wrong. And that cost you a lot of money. So as quickly as possible, if you're in this area, go out of it. Take care. Aim for the right amount of validity. Talk with your colleagues. The problem is your colleagues have another idea what validity is than you have. Your boss has no idea. Talk about this you model with your colleagues and say, for which amount of validity should we go? And then take care about statistics. Don't, don't do evil stuff. I know 
I know Pip wrote a blog post why IA tests don't make sense, and he's right. Except one thing, make an AA test just to see once how strong these random effects are. And you see it, that it takes maybe four weeks until it's gone. Um, don't segment to death and forget your ideas about statistics. And for the ones, guys, Google alpha error inflation. And don't do multivariate tests without knowing about this stuff. If you're here, you may be realized you, know, you realized you need more effectiveness. So don't do trial and error. Don't test templates or don't change templates. Ask yourself, what is user's motivation? How can I use behavioral economics? It's easy to use it. Use qualitative methods to get more impact. Prioritize your hypothesis with the four questions I told you. And then you will be much more effective and you will go into this stage. And in this stage, change your focus. Optimize the optimization process. Measure your success rate, okay? Measure your ROI of testing, improve it. Improve the amount of tests you do, but also improve the average uplift. You have to measure these things. Make a dashboard with these things. If you don't have a dashboard, if you're not measuring it, you won't be able to change it. That's for sure. If you have data about this, then you can ask yourself, where did the best optimization hypothesis come from? And then you can optimize the optimization. And then you're at the very right side of this curve. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. <laughs> if your site is new, yes. and you don't have many people there, yes. can you still somehow use the bandwagon effect without being a liar? <laughs> you have to be careful. Uh, a lot of people say that, um, that, uh, that Booking.com is lying. <laughs> and it's not true. Booking.com is very aware that they have to use real data. So don't lie to people. Maybe you'll get a short uplift, but you, you hurt your brand because you're a liar and people will, will find out. Never do that. Um, so if you, if, you, if you don't have any reputation like this, I'm sorry, you just can't use the effect. Well, on that note, uh, what is your um, favorite cognitive bias and why? Which one? Oh, there is no favorite. Uh, there are a lot of effects that I like, and they're easy to apply in e-commerce, like contrast effects, framing, priming, and whatever. All of this is, is a, a pure, I don't know, like playground. Um, it, you can use that really as a brainstorming technique that you pick one by random and try ask yourself with, with the, some group of people, with a team, ask yourself, how could we use it? And you will find a lot of things that you can't apply depending on your business model, but you will find a lot of jewels where you think, oh, we could do it like this. Uh, but there's no favorite one. All right, thank you, Andre. You're welcome. Thank you.